なるほどね。はい、おやめ。はい。
Yes, please. May I know who I'm talking to? Thank you.
UK 2022. This is plenary number three. Will we still be able to do cybersecurity in five years? Hosted by NCSC Director Dr. Ian Levy. This is a big chair. That's quite scary. Small person, thank you, Mr. Harcourt, very kind. Um, so look, thanks for coming back. Um, I know it's been a long day. I know some of you may have been up late last night or maybe early this morning. Not me, obviously, I'd never do that. <laughs> um, we hope to have an entertaining discussion. There's four of us, Amit is up there. Um, I will introduce uh, my fellow panelists, uh, do a very quick outline and then hand over to each of them to give some uh, initial thoughts. And then we'll have a nice discussion and then uh, we go for booze or your beverage of choice afterwards. Uh, so we are between you and booze. More importantly, we're between me and booze. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's going to be fine. So uh, joining me, uh, I have Gwenda Fong, who is the Deputy Assistant Chief Executive of the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore. I have Professor Madeleine Carr, Professor of Cybersecurity and Geopolitics at UCL. And Thank you very much, Amit, for staying up late. Back in India, I have Amit Sharma, cyber advisor in the Indian Ministry of Defense, and it's half 10 at night, and he's doing a panel. So thank you, Amit, we really appreciate it. Um, what I thought we'd talk about is kind of the future of cybersecurity, but not in the normal way of, you know, we need to patch more and all that kind of stuff, but much more about the geopolitics of what's coming, the technology that's coming. So there's a bunch of things that are changing over the next few years that I think we're gonna to have to uh, evolve around. So the first one is tech is obviously getting much more embedded in our everyday lives. So today, kind of your physical identity is your, is your primary identity. In the future, you could imagine a, a time when your digital identity is your primary identity. And so it's impossible for you to uh, interact in society without this digital identity. And if we get to that case, it cannot be the case then that accidentally clicking a link when you've had a few drinks is the end of your digital identity. That cannot be true at that point. So there's a bunch of things we have to change about our reliance on technology. Um, the second one is around the commoditization of threat. So it used to be the case that for you to get into kind of nation state cyber attacks, you had to spend a few years doing it. You'd spend a decade learning how to do it, understanding proportionality, understanding second order effects. Now you can just go buy it for $2 million. And so literally anybody can go buy nation state capability. And that fundamentally changes some of the uh, impacts that we're gonna have to deal with. Um, the third thing that's changing is balkanization of technology. So we've grown up in a world where technology is universally acceptable. But we've grown up in a world where interoperability is the way things work. That's changed. Just don't think we've quite noticed yet. And what does that mean for us? And I'm thinking about things like 5G and semiconductors. You know, the world is turning into two ecosystems. What does that mean for how we do cybersecurity? And then... Um, the final thing is around standards and how these technologies are defined, how this interoperability is defined. Um, that, again, is changing. So it used to be the case that it was open, free, well-managed, and everybody had a good vote, and now it's not. And what does that mean for how the technology develops and what values they, that technology embodies and what that means for cybersecurity and privacy? So that's what we're going to try and talk about, hopefully. Um, but I'm going to turn to each of you and just ask you to introduce yourselves and just give your opening thoughts on that. Gwenda, do you want to start? All right, thank you very much. Um, so firstly, thank you for having me on the panel. Um, so as the Assistant Chief Executive in the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore, I cover strategy, policy, legislative issues. Um, and since the panel is going to be you know, talking about the geopolitics of technology, I thought I'd start my comments by talking a little bit about globalization and, and, and where we are in terms of technology. So up until recently, globalization was really the favored um, path. Um, we were generally optimistic about the global possibilities for the internet and, and digital technologies because of the scalability and imperviousness of uh, technology uh, to, to the traditional um, jurisdictional and geographical kind of boundaries. And the past few decades have also seen the globalization of our economy and um, culture and, and has resulted in a hyper-connected world that we live in today. So a lot of the, the technologies and platforms that we have today emerge in this context and they are by large um, global and interoperable. 
But the political winds have been shifting, and in the last five years or so, tribalism and nationalism have become a lot more um, uh, 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 apparent and on the rise. And globalization is perhaps no longer seen um, as a panacea, as the the people kind of sour over the global haves and have-nots. So this anti-globalization fragmentation has also played out in um, the cyber domain. So for instance, we see the US and China developing um, 5G technologies quite independently of each other. And uh, we've also seen setbacks in the discussion on like, international cyber norms at the UN. So the world is uh, currently at the crossroads. And while we may not be prepared to give up the, the gains that globalization and international collaboration has um, brought us in a decade since Bretton Woods. But I think there are very strong forces at play right now that um, are causing countries to rethink if they really need to be plugged in wholly into this uh, globalized order. So um, let's have a discussion around that. Yep. Madeline? Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, so I'm, I'm an international relations academic, and I've always looked at, at cybersecurity. And, and I, I've, I've looked quite, quite in depth at how what the role that technology plays in international competition and in national power. Um, and of course, technology has always, you know, been a major factor of, of national power and, and international order. Um, but, but it was quite a bit more simple, you know, 50 years ago, 50, 60 years ago, because we would think about, uh, you know, uh, military technology, weapons technology, or communications technology, or, or um, transport technology. And these factors were really important in, in you know, the, the, the um, likely outcome of, of, a, of a conflict, of a political conflict. But the, over the last 50 or 60 years, we've seen this change to to digital technologies, which are just so much more complicated for the way we think about national power, because they're so inter interdependent, they're so, you know, we've got this just incredibly complex nested, you know, um, uh, kind of bird's nest of, of a supply chain where services and, and, and devices are kind of interdependent and, and, uh, and, and connected endlessly complex and so it makes it very difficult to kind of unpack that and think about what this means for us and I think in part just picking up on Glenda's point about globalization this this partially explains why we're seeing this return to nationalism because the the promise of globalization really was that the more interdependent we were that would it, it, that would bring about peace because interdependence would would give us common you know uh, common goals common objectives common concerns and and that would be you know bring about peace but actually what we've seen with with digital technologies and international relations is that interdependence it, it can bring about um, peace certainly and cooperation but it also can bring about additional power for some players and additional insecurity for other players and the real problem now is that these kind of mechanisms we've had in place for governing uh, political conflict and, and technology and political conflict aren't, aren't really suited to, to where we are now. Yeah, thanks Madeline. And Amit, do you, do you want to introduce yourself and give your initial thoughts? Thanks Ian. Uh, first of all, for me, I'm Amit Sharma. I'm uh, Director and Advisor Cyber with the Ministry of Defense, Government of India. One of the important aspects, if you look at technology, or I would rather stick to cyberspace or the digital ICT, it has penetrated almost every aspect of uh, the way in which we do our business, the, day we, uh, the, the way in which our societies work. And last uh, couple of years, especially during the pandemic, has literally exacerbated the way in which technology, the, the way in which ICT has touched our ways of life. And that's phenomenal. You know, the way in which our regimes are changing, our uh, strategies are changing, everything. To give you a small and a very funny example, because typically in the defense environment, uh, we always used to think, you know, it's always about fortification. It's always about layers of defense. And, you know, you have to have leaves, uh, surface area, attack surface area, and so on. That's been the classical way of thought. But suddenly we had the pandemic and uh, those strategies need to change. 
because now we are looking into scenarios where work from home is a common day to day things. So what exactly is happening is technology is going beyond what it was initially envisaged to be, or rather digital space is going beyond what it initially it was envisaged to be. It's stretching our basic tenets of our societal uh, interactions with each other at the human level, and then subsequently uh, at the national level and then at the global level. But as we speak, ICT is a force multiplier. It's, it's phenomenal, it's, uh, it literally, changes the way in which we do business. But at the same time, <clears throat> it also has a disruptive effect. Many a times, this introduces what we call as the asymmetry. And the moment this asymmetry uh, happens, and it has happened every, if you see, you know, uh, the history of war or uh, the dominance of technology, throughout the history of war or throughout uh, the, G, uh, the world order that has been there, technology has played a very critical part of it. It's not the fact that this is something very new we are seeing. It has happened in the past. And whenever there is a disruptive technology, let's take the example of, you know, uh, the first nuclear explosion. It literally changed, you know, uh, subsequently it was used uh, in the peaceful uh, aspects in terms of harnessing power and so on. But at the same time, that technology changed the world order. And each time, whenever there is a revolution in this path breaking revolution in technology, it has a direct and indirect effect onto uh, what we call as the global balance in the world. Now, when we come specifically with regard uh, to this panel, over a period of time, if you see internet itself, the internet was primarily, if you see the first definition of internet, it was the network of networks. The only idea was there were excluded networks all around the world and they were connected together to form a larger internet and that's how it has grown. It has, I would rather say it has evolved. It's not something that has happened, you know, in a whiff of a second or something like that. It's not something like a big bang. It's just, it has evolved over time. And when you have a system which has evolved over time, there are a lot of issues that pertains to the legacy aspects that are there. And those aspects results into the way in which evolving it as per the societal needs. And in the current day scenario, as the world order or the political order is been changing around the world, this new technology, this new asymmetry provides uh, certain aspects where this can be utilized both for the peaceful uh, purposes or what I usually called as the opportunities and also add the other aspect, you know, uh, what we call as the militarization aspects of it, what we call it typically as the threats. But Having said so, I would always say, you know, the key point is to look at the opportunities rather than concentrating on to the threats. Nevertheless, the threats are to be taken up because that is when the opportunities can be capitalized. Thanks, Amit. That's brilliant. Um, so I'm going to start off with a, an assertion that's going to annoy everybody in the audience because, um, you know, I can. Um, so I'm going to start by saying I don't think we're actually very good at cybersecurity. Nobody, nobody said anything, <laughs> wow. Um, so I don't think we're very good at cybersecurity because it's not very scientific. It's still a lot of gut feeling. Um, and that's despite all the investment we've all put into it over the years. Um, so even simple sounding things like, you know, we, we're gonna say, oh, we're gonna increase the internet resilience. Okay, so if you're gonna increase something, you have to be able to measure it. And then you've gotta be able to say what resilience means. Resilient to what? Is it resilient to somebody driving a JCB into a Metro Telecoms node? Or is it resilient to the Russians turning absolutely everything they have against you. And then you've got to define what the internet is. Is it the pipes and wires, as Amit was just explaining, the network of networks, or is it the services we all rely on? Um, so if we're gonna be more rigorous about cybersecurity, what do you think we're gonna to have to do to start to get on that journey? And I think, Amit, I'm gonna be really unfair and come straight back to you to start with. <laughs> Not an issue at all. Uh, to be honest, if you look at, uh, I start with my earlier argument itself. Internet, it's a evolving beast. It's not something that just, you know, was created. It wasn't created for the scenarios what we are looking at our plate right now. You talked about something very perennial, the cybersecurity aspects, and are, are we really, 
up to the challenge, up to the mark. My first preposition is that when you talk about uh, cybersecurity, if you see internet, internet was never built for cybersecurity. If you see the fundamental tenets on the basis of which internet was created, it was networking, it was integrating, it was never cybersecurity. Now suddenly, over a period of time, as this bees has evolved, so suddenly people started realizing that yes, we have done something good. We have, you know, it's the euphoria movement and so on. We have created something beautiful. But then you saw threats. Apart from the opportunities, you started looking at the threats. And that is when somebody actually thought that, no, it's more about security. But whenever you deal with legacy systems all around the world, and that's been a global, uh, you know, aspect, you're looking into multiple systems, you know, if, if you look at the current internet in, uh, architecture itself, that's basically the combination of multiple uh, autonomous systems, AS, and they are, and each of these AS, uh, they are essentially governed by their own technology, they are governed by their own protocols, and nevertheless, over a period of time, this was primarily done with an intention of inclusiveness, with an intention that, yes, no island remains unconnected. None of these technology islands remain unconnected because the key goal was networking to interconnect. But then subsequently, when you started off with this key goal, you realized, yes, there is what we call as the threats that need to be uh, taken care of. Then only we can capitalize on the opportunities. So that's where we started retrofitting security into the internet. And that's where the biggest challenge came into. Whenever you do retro, uh, you know, retrofitting something externally into a system, overall, the system becomes much more complex. The system becomes much more non-deterministic, primarily because of, the, because of the fact that you actually had a system which was supposed to be non-deterministic. You had a system which was supposed to be just connected with everyone in whatever technology they are working, in whatever protocols they are working, just on one common uh, network. And that's, that's how things have evolved. Another important aspect, uh, if you look at with regard to resilience, yes, if you have one common technology, if you have one common set of protocols, if you have one common set of standards, things become much more easier. But as I said, you know, if you have a whole bunch of things, it's almost like a, the classical Indian Thali. I do not know whether most of you know it or not. So you have, it's, it's a large, it's, it's a British version of a large buffet. And, but trust me, you know, the choices are much more and uh, probably much more spicier. So when you have such a big thali that is there, you need to find out what is the exact mix. You need to find out how these uh, particular dishes need to be eat, uh, need to be eaten and how exactly, uh, what would be the sequence? You know, sometimes you might look at something thinking that it's uh, something very salty and probably, you know, that's the taste of the tongue. But the moment you eat it, you find it's very sweet. And that's exactly what internet is all about. Because when you have to look into that, first of all, you need to define, and you asked about resilience. First of all, you need to define what resilience of what system, resilience of what technology, resilience of what stack, resilience of what protocols, resilience of what infrastructure. And that's a very big thali. It's a very big plate. And that's where the fundamental problem starts with. The approaches are quite simple. One is, you know, what we call as, you know, the big bang approach. Just, you know, you change the thali, you create out, you know, it's, it's almost like uh, uh, the British way of eating, you know, you have uh, chips, uh, you know, fish, and that's it. You, you are very clear about it. And then a pint of beer along with that. So, you know, things become much more easier because you know your choices, you know what you have to eat, how you have to eat, and probably at the end of it, you'll have a pie. So everything is very much systematic. That's the fundamental of creating out uh, uh, what we call as a standards stack. But the key issue is whether that British Thali is going to be something that's going to be liked by, let's say, uh, a, a country X or a country Y or a country Z. And that's where the fundamental problem starts with. I hope you like my example because we are sitting in between probably your uh, supper. That is the most stretched analogy I have heard <laughs> in a long time. But it was funny. Thank you. Scientific cybersecurity, what do you think? 
Um, so one of the things I'd say is, um, from a research perspective, is we're constantly lacking data. And your, your point about, you know, how can we measure, first of all, we need to define it, of, of, of course, but how can we measure it? There's so much data generated all the time, DNS resolution data, um, you know, te telemetry data that, that because, it's, because it's got commercial value, it's commodified and, and it's locked up in, in the private sector and it's, it's very difficult or impossible to access that data. So it's very difficult to measure, you know, a, a lot of these, um, of these uh, things that we would like to. And I think I'd make a plea for that. I mean, there was a great presentation this morning, uh, the, the, the data sharing uh, initiative that the NCSC has, has uh, implemented. But I think having access to data is, is really important. And the other thing is, of course, is this kind of multi-stakeholder approach, which we're very good at. Um, you know, we, we, we bring together different, uh, different stakeholders to, to, to understand one another's perspectives. And I would say, just as a sort of glimmer of, of optimism, that if we, if we look at what's happened in the business sector over the last four or five years, where, you know, five years ago, most boards would say they didn't, you know, they, they didn't know even how to approach this. And I think increasingly we see business leaders can say what matters to them with regards to cybersecurity. They, 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 you know, it's, it's business continuity, it's, it's um, you know, how long will it take them to get back up, how many customers will they lose if, if they suffer a breach. So they're actually getting quite good at quantifying that in the business sector. And, and you know, maybe there's um, ironically some lessons that we could learn um, from them. So you mentioned multi-stakeholder approaches. Um, I think that takes us nicely onto standards. So most of the technology we use today embodies standards that are set in various ways, right? Either you know, proper standards defining organizations or de facto standards produced by big companies uh, and then just rolled out to 50% you know, of the population. Um, we should talk about those sorts of standards and how they embody values. Uh, and you know, whether a networking protocol defaults to security and privacy or to surveillance, whether it defaults to distributed control or centralized control, those are the sorts of things that, are, that we're gonna have to deal with. Um, I don't think those standards bodies and the way we set them were ever set up to be kind of a tool of great power competition. What do you think, Gwen? Do you want to start? Um, I think it's difficult to um, firstly predict what kinds of, uh, of values or, or standards are going to be needed in future because it really depends on how society and our norms kind of evolve. But um, I think we can probably agree that the less inclusive um, the values are and the less interoperability that the standards promote um, would lead to a more volatile and, and um, unstable kind of environment. Um, in the international legal order, it's founded on consensus building on things that you know, people have agreed um, to because this is a stable model uh, on, on which um, we can basically decide on things in the international arena. And there are institutions that exist um, to facilitate the consensus building and to safeguard the standards that have been um, agreed on. And these are in areas that matter, such as in trade, health, um, territorial kind of uh, boundaries and security in the physical realm. We don't have today uh, an equivalent in the cyber domain. That's why it's uh, important to do some of the work that's being done at the UN, for instance, at the um, UN Group of Governmental Experts and the Open-Ended Working Group, because I see those as the first steps towards um, agreeing on a framework for cyber norms and, and um, how you know, states should be operating. Uh, eventually, that kind of leads into a set of standards that are internationally agreed upon, and then you need to kind of have institutions in place to kind of safeguard those standards. Madeline, anything to add? Well, I, I guess just one thing I would add is that um, the, the situation with standards now and this, co this great power competition that really is, is taking hold in standard setting bodies reminds me very much of those early years of internet governance where um, you know, you very much there was this approach that that was something that those technical guys will do and it's very dry and boring and, you know, and nothing to do with us and just they'll work out the best way to do it. Standard setting bodies have, you know, to a large extent also been run by very committed, dedicated 
volunteer uh, volunteers and and we, we need to remember that but increasingly that that is not what's happening in standard setting bodies and um, increasingly it's 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 acknowledged that these are sites of real power and the the processes in 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 some of these bodies are really you know deeply questionable um, you know in, in terms of how you get something on an agenda how you vote um, you know when votes take place surprisingly uh, when there was not meant to be one and you know these kind of practices which, which really mean that there, there's you know we need to look under the hood of these things basically and and yeah um, take very careful note of what's going on in them are you suggesting that voting by humming is not the way we should define how the, <laughs> yeah. the world works? So, so everybody knows that, right? So in, in the IETF, which sets some of the like, core internet standards, you vote by humming. Right? I'm pretty sure you can game that if you can hum loud. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but seriously, I mean, there's, there's a real question yeah. here about, you know, sort of the, as you say, the processes that are being used to set the future direction of the things we are all going to rely on. Yeah. Um, a bit of audience participation, I haven't done this for a while. So put your hand up if you think your views are being properly represented at standards bodies. Okay, you're either all asleep or you're all right. <laughs> you're laughing, I'll go, for, I'll go for you're all right. So this is part of the problem, right? We, kind of, we have this done by proxy to us. Um, and people who claim to speak for you know, us as people um, set these standards and put their own values in them, whether they're national values or personal values. Um, I'm going to regret this. No more food analogies, but Amit, do you have anything, <laughs> <laughs> anything to think uh, uh, to comment on standards bodies and how they work? Now, trust me. Now, the uh, you know the technical part of me would speak. You know, many times I have always thought that it is the analogies that work pretty good when it comes to you know taking the message across. Now, if you talk about standards, you know, as we are right at a very important cusp. Uh, for example, the focus group uh, 2030, you know, we are actually shaping around that what's going to be the future of Internet, how exactly the next generation Internet would look into. And there are some serious challenges for which this next generation Internet should work on. For example, like we are moving into a new form of web where augmented reality, you know, you, you're looking into telemedicine, you are looking into, you know, remote surgeries. You are looking into applications which are which need what we call as deterministic forwarding. You are looking into applications which should require a very high level of quality of service. You are looking into uh, applications which are almost near real time. Now, this particular aspect leads to another important uh, aspect that we need to look into is the need for higher bandwidth. And when you move into a higher bandwidth scale, you are looking into the next generation standards when you come, you look across 6G or, uh, you know, in fact, we are still with 5G, but yes, by the time 2030 is there, 6G and probably something else. And that's what is the evolution part of it. But when you are looking into these particular standards, when you are looking into, you know, right now, and it's, it's very interesting times to tell you very frankly, uh, right now we are looking into a major transformational change. And whenever there is a major transformational change, you are looking into a gap between what is called as the legacy systems or the legacy protocols or the legacy technologies. And what you are looking into is uh, the new generation of technologies that you envisage purely driven by science, purely driven by technology. And then in between something, there are two large beasts in the play. The first beast is the industry. And the second beast is what we call as the state actors. And uh, pardon me for saying it, that's the complexity of a multi-stakeholder approach, you know, because everyone has to be on board. And that's the key. Everyone has to be on board. So when you have all these varied scenarios, and when you have, you know, a growing demand, because one thing you would all agree with me, internet requires to be changed. There is a need for, we are evolving the new set of applications. You know, let's talk about quantum networks. Let's talk about uh, artificial intelligence. Let's talk about augmented reality. You know, the applications are changing. We are going into much more strategic space. And at this cusp, when you are looking into a global need for a new form of internet, then subsequently the whole points lies into 
how we create a sense out of this chaos. And that's where the standards or this evolution process comes into the play. This evolution process, typically there are the two forces that have the pulls and pushes. One very large force, as I said earlier, is the industry, which always looks into what is called as the return on investment. Uh, when you are looking into, you know, a sizable investment in terms of IPv4 and then migration of that IPv4 into an IPv6 stack and so on. So that's that's a very sizable investment that the industry is involved into. And then when you are looking into uh, the nation states, which are primarily looking into aspects related to resilience, aspect related to business continuity. And when I say business continuity, not just at uh, uh, industry level or a company level or so on, but they are looking at business continuity of the nation. Now, when you have this very complicated mix of dynamics evolving around this, then you have two approaches. Typically, that's what I always believe. One approach is the quick approach. You know, you just create out uh, a set of standard. You float it out in most of uh, these focus groups, let's say ITU or uh, IETF and so on. All these, uh, you know, uh, standards making bodies and so on. You, you just throw out the ball, let the ball rolling. And then subsequently, you know, the other set of pulls and pushes uh, comes into the play. Yes, the ball is fine, but uh, probably the way in which it's going, it might harm into what we call as the already existing investment, or probably it's too revolutionized that uh, right now, the evolution of the existing legacy systems would not get evolved. Just look into the example, you know, uh, Elon Musk's Starlink. That's that's phenomenal, you know, that kind of uh, internet, uh, you know, uh, the way in which internet was invest is such uh, probably two decades from now and the way in which internet is provided right now that's never been you know thought of quantum networks never been thought of you know quant qkd you know we are we are just struggling with dnssec and so on but now we are talking about qkds you are talking about post quantum cryptography so that's where the pulls and pushes comes into the play my suggestion has always been that nothing which is globally accepted because consensus is the key issue nothing what is globally accepted can happen overnight but yes it requires a lot of thorough deliberations it requires the assessment both at technical level it requires assessment at political level it requires assessment from financial point of view you know the business sustainability as uh, internet is not run just by few countries it's it's actually a conglomerate it's what we call as the super uh, you know the super national infrastructure that's that's beyond things so you need to have financial analysis and when you do all these kind of analysis then only you need to work out what is the common minimum because at the end of it i always believe that internet is something like a global common and when you are dealing with global common you don't make an approach just to suit uh, one side of the story it's it's always need to be on consensus basis i hope it's it was not uh, related to food <laughs> <laughs> so look, um you've got countries standing up now and saying you know we're going to be awesome at everything that matters so you know the uk has published its integrated review and we've said we're going to be a science and technology superpower awesome we <laughs> <laughs> National Cyber Strategy talks about us leading in the technology vital to cyber power. Awesome. Uh, last week, the US published something saying how they were going to um, maintain competitive advantage in quantum information science. Awesome. Uh, China's published a couple of things. Made in China 2025. Awesome. And China Standards 2035. Um, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we, talk, we briefly touched before on you know, standards bodies and the way we define technology um, being used as tools of great power. Um, what do you think we need to do to try and get some of this, to minimise the harm that we could cause ourselves if we're not careful? Madeline, can I start with you? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm talking as someone who works in the higher education sector and the research sector in, in the UK, and I guess I'm seeing some concerning trends so the the, the this kind of um, explosion of uh, research into digital technologies that took place following the Sputnik uh, launch of uh, you know in 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 whatever it was 1950 something 
um, in the US was really based on investment in research. And it was in, based on in, investment in fundamental research that didn't necessarily have commercial applications yet. It was, you know, it was the, the birth of, our, of DARPA. And it was, it, you know, it, it really fundamentally led to that huge dominance of, of the US in digital technologies that, that has been sustained for the last you know, half century, 70 years. Now, in, in the UK, there's a couple of factors that are very concerning to me. One is um, Brexit. So now for us to, to fund students on, on scholarships, they have to be actually British students. They can't even be European anymore. And that's not a good student cohort. A good research community has people from all over the world. So it's very difficult for us to bring students from beyond the, the kind of our own shores. The, the rise of universities in China, for example, they, they now have some first class universities in, in China, and they're growing all the time. Um, Chinese students soon won't necessarily want to come to the UK to study. Um, and I, I think, you know, we need to be very careful that our own research community, which is very much a pillar of UK power, is that university sector doesn't get swept, swept away in in, in this process. And I think that the access and the investment in, in research in, in this country, in the solutions that we want, that we need, is, is absolutely fundamental. And I know that's not easy for, for a, a place the size of the UK, but I think it's something we need to be very, very mindful of, is, is losing that edge. Gwenda, thoughts? Um, I think big states and small states have a, quite a different perspective on this. You talked about the U.S.'s um, uh, strategies, the U.K.'s review, and you know, China's kind of plans. And each of these big uh, countries can bank on kind of developing their own tech stack, de developing their own domestic kind of capabilities, um, and being self-sufficient, and basically stripping out everything from a non-trusted you know, company or, or country. From, a, from Singapore's perspective, as a small state, it's not, um, it's not an option that's available to us. We are so small, we, we don't have the resources to kind of you know, do it ourselves, and we are very much vulnerable to um, the larger kind of uh, dynamics at play. So from, from a small state point of view, we certainly don't want to choose sites. <laughs> we, we, want to, um, we, we hope that you know, internationally, technology continues to be interoperable, um, and, and they're like global standards. Um, and in, in, in my view, I think power, big power contestation in this space is dangerous because when things fragment, um, it becomes a little bit less, uh, there's less common interest uh, for all of us to protect the common infrastructure. Uh, we talked about this uh, backstage and I think um, Madeline also referred to it earlier. It, it basically makes for, it, it changes the calculation of uh, big powers and it, it, it just makes for a, a much less kind of a stable environment for us all. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> that, um, that difference between big states and small states I think is really important and building coalitions of like-minded states is gonna be really important yes. in the future, even more than it is today. So we're nearly out of time. So we've, we've talked about a lot of stuff and it, it's, it's probably quite unsatisfactory because we've gone, hey, look, here's a bunch of problems. We have no clue how to fix them. Um, but. Assume we can fix the dumb stuff, right? So assume we can fix people patching and buffer overflows and passwords, right? In the next couple of years. Um, I assert that we've kind of already balkanized technology and we just haven't noticed yet. Um, in 30 seconds each, what's the one thing you would ask our audience to do, our global audience on YouTube, not just the people here, um, to do in the medium term to help make sure that we can do cybersecurity in the future in five or 10 years time? I'm going to come to you first, if that's okay. 30 seconds only, though. Uh, I always believe that uh, one of the key aspects in cyberspace is more about cross-domain entities, people with cross-domain knowledge. It's not just about technologists. It's not just about policymakers. It's not just about academicians. It's not just about business. It's as a whole process. And essentially, if we need to do anything into cyber, you know, Tech, uh, technology would be the last of my 
aspects. I would believe in the three shifts. The first one is uh, friendship. You know, you need to have friendship among countries, among people, among businesses. You need to have partnerships, partnerships uh, with industry. You need to have partnership globally. And most importantly, you need to have leadership and leadership in terms of technology, in terms of uh, looking at the larger picture. In, again, the key point is the preservation of the global commons. And in order to achieve this leadership, friendship and partnership, you need to have two important aspects. The trust, a trust among people, trust with regard to uh, you know, your supply chain, which essentially, to be honest, uh, we are already going into a zero trust model and so on. But trust is the key. And the other important aspect is responsibility. Responsibility, not just to your own citizens, but responsibility when it comes to global commons to the entire world, all the people, all the humanity. Till the time we do not have trust and responsibility, we won't be able to build these three ships and we won't be able to solve this cybersecurity chaos. Thank you. Gwenda? Um, so firstly, I think while I agree that um, balkanization is already underway, I don't think it's, uh, the trajectory is completely inevitable. Mm -hmm. um, I think that digital giants uh, have a, a big role to play in this because their incentives are not always aligned with that of states. So it's uh, not entirely clear to me that you know, digital giants will go the way of, of, um, of, of having separate kind of uh, tech stacks. Um, the one thing that I would say is to continue to push for interoperability because um, Having, having kind of a balkanized technology is a lot more expensive, it's, it's difficult to um, manage, and once the silos are established, it is sticky, and it requires a lot of resources and political will to undo. Um, and while extricating from this uh, you know, global commons may seem like a solution to certain sets of problems, but I would argue that a fragmented uh, tech world brings its, brings its own sets of problems, which um, could perhaps be even more challenging for us. Right, Madeline, final word. So I feel like Amit's uh, recommendation was very warm and happy and, and Gwenda's was very sensible. Um, so I'm gonna finish on a pessimistic note. <laughs> and, I, and I would say that not to assume that things will go the way we want them to or the way they have in the past, that it is absolutely you know, up to us to shape things in the direction that we want them to go and that we need them to go. And, and that's gonna take effort because our competitors are certainly um, very well prepared, very organized and um, long-term planners. So build trust, drive for interoperability, get involved. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. So that's what we need you to do. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you, Amit, for staying up late. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Gwenda and Madeline, for your insight. I have small announcements. So small announcement number one, thank you first to Ben and Mark, our amazing sign language interpreters. Um, <laughs> people translating in real time scares the living hell out of me. <laughs> Genuinely, I don't understand how people do it. <laughs> I dread to think what he's actually just signed, but I'm going to trust him. <laughs> uh, second announcement is um, we have an Industry 100 spotlight stage out in the uh, forum, not forum, the reception outside. Uh, my colleague and friend Paul Madison will be introducing Industry 100. Go see it, go ask questions, it's going to be awesome. And then finally, and of course this is of no interest to me, there is a reception outside with booze. Thank you very much for staying. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for engagement. See you all in the bar.